Hello, everyone. We are in the stage two of the API days uh, virtual conference. Now, it's Eric Blow, uh, one of the MC of the stage two today. Welcome all of you guys to attend this stage for API product and community track. Uh, we will have uh, three great sharings on different topics for our chat before the tea break. Now, uh, for the new joiners, uh, here is some introduction for you, uh, what we will do in these sharing sessions. First of all, we will have a sharing from the guest presenter and have a Q&A session after that. Feel free to ask us any question in the stage check. Now, we will have uh, the first guest speaker, Maxim, who, who is the senior developer advocate at MobileDB. Hey, hi, everybody. Thanks, Eric, Hello. for the intro. Yeah, how hi, nice to meet you. Yeah, okay. Uh, Maxim will present how to build a serverless uh, API for the COVID-19 in 20 minutes. Okay, COVID is a hot topic in global nowadays, and the serverless is becomes hot in IT industry this year. That's also, it sounds interesting for mixing these two topics together for this talk. Yes, Okay, exactly. it's your time yes. right now. Cool, thank you very much. Thanks, let's go. So hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Maxime Bonnier. I'm a senior developer advocate uh, at MongoDB. And uh, I built a few things uh, using the COVID data set. Uh, so REST API, Graph, GraphQL API, some charts, uh, an open data set, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to discuss a bit uh, all that with you and show you all the great stuff uh, I produced with the MongoDB stack. So let's jump right in. Uh, so of course, uh, I will show you how to build a GraphQL and a REST API uh, live, actually, at the end of this presentation. So it's about like 10 minutes slides and 10 minutes uh, live coding and demo. Uh, let's jump right in. So uh, everybody knows in 2019, the world was great, and then we had COVID, right? So my, my idea was to, uh, my goal was to make that data uh, about COVID as much as possible available, made great charts, made APIs, and make all that data available to uh, all the people around the world. I'm not a doctor, so I can't solve the COVID uh, using my uh, doctor uh, skills, you know, so I can at least use my uh, uh, coding skills, right? So that was my share, you know. So I built some um, dashboard like those, you know, using uh, MongoDB charts. Uh, I built some of those. You have the link, actually, of those uh, charts and that dashboard at the end of this presentation. I can share all that with you at the end. And uh, so that was my idea. You know, find some data, find a way to use that data and produce those charts and produce some APIs along the way, right? That was my goal. So to do that, uh, I was inspired by John Hopkins University. I think everybody saw uh, that cool dashboard they produced, right? So uh, they show... Uh, like the COVID and all the states, you know, all the number of cases, number of deaths, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and if you look at the bottom here, there is a term of use. And in the term of use, there is actually a GitHub repository that you can use. It's highlighted by this small arrow on the screen. And uh, you can uh, use that repository actually to, um, to get some data. The repository looks like this. Uh, it's actually pretty simple. It's just a few folders. And in those folders, you can find uh, a few, um, uh, you can, um, sorry, you can uh, find a few CSV files, right? And CSV files are very, uh, very cool to work with, very easy to parse, et cetera, et cetera. But they are kind of a nightmare, you know, when you want to produce uh, uh, charts or REST APIs, et cetera. So uh, the thing is, I didn't want to do uh, better than, than they did, right? So uh, the data that I got was as good as it was. Initially, I thought about doing my own um, my own data set, actually, like uh, go directly to the source of the data, you know, like the government, uh, WHO, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and try to find my own data source. Uh, but when you look at the list of all the data sources they used to produce that data set, you just assume that you won't do a better job, right? So uh, it, it was better than <laughs> it was better than good for me. Uh, I, I couldn't do a better job myself and all my own. Uh, so uh, I just decided to trust whatever data they produce and just uh, you know trust what they have. Um, so if we look uh, initially, so I was you know looking for you know a reliable data source. So I was looking for 
something I could use to feed my data, my data set. So uh, initially, I looked at the daily repositories, right? There is a, a daily repository, daily folder, and they produce one file for each day, right? So it looks pretty good, you know, pretty neat. So every day, I could just add the new um, the new data, you know, in my um, uh, in my data set. So if you look at the first file uh, in that long, long list, right? So it was the 22nd of January, 2020. Uh, you see something like that, right? So that's a CSV file. You have province slash state, country slash region, last update. You see uh, this date format, which is a bit weird, but why not? And you see confirmed death and recovered cases, which looked good. Uh, but some columns or, you know, some cells are empty because apparently it's zeros. So why not? Um, so, you know, why not? And then you look at one other file, you know, a random one in April, and then it looks like this, you know, completely different. If you look a bit at the differences, like you have new columns at the beginning, FIPS, FIPS and admin2, it's not province slash state anymore, it's province underscore state, so it's a bit inconsistent and hard to parse. You have to fix this in the code somewhere in the data import. Uh, the date format is different. You have no latitude and longitude with a typo in longitude with a weird underscore. Um, you have zeros nodes also in the confirmed death and recovered columns. Uh, so it's not just an empty field anymore. So it's also a difference and also something you have to hack. Uh, you have active and combined keys now at the end. So it's whole different, right? So uh, it's very like not consistent, not predictable. Looks like they can change. Um, Every day, uh, they can change the, the the format of the file and the format of the columns and how they produce that. So that, that that's not good, right? Like I can't really use that to produce a REST API that would be consistent and even, right? And, and make sense for the users. So the, if you want to build a good API, my my advice is to be consistent, right? Find something that's consistent and build something that people can rely rely on. So if they send a query to get data for, you know. Uh, January uh, 22nd of uh, 2020, they expect to get the same thing for 2021. It's not something completely different. So then I looked at one other folder, right, which is a time series, which is the other uh, type of data that I produce. And in this folder, it's actually a bit more simple, right? There are only five CSV files, five CSV files, sorry. Uh, three of them are called uh, global. So they represent uh, countries or eventually countries divided in states. And then you have uh, confirm and death for the US. So only two files here because they don't count recovered cases. And actually they stopped counting recovered cases very recently. It was uh, like about two weeks ago. Uh, so in those files you have the US and with all the details, right? So it's uh, all the US divided in states and divided in counties, right? So it's very, very divided. Um, so yeah, if you look at one of those files, they all actually look the same and they look like this, right? So you have province state, country regions, latitude, longitude, and then you have a bunch of columns, you know, and you have one column basically per date, which is very cool. That's exactly what I was looking for. You know, one, one value for one day for one place. So you see like France, it's subdivided into states, right? So you have like different one. The one at the bottom is the mainland, right? There is no state, so it's like the mainland and all the different uh, small states, you know, we call those uh, dum dum here in France. And so every day they update this file and add a new column at the end, right? So pretty simple to parse, very easy and readable, right? So uh, the thing is that uh, schema, if I use Mongo import, which is one of the tools we provide in MongoDB, uh, if we just use Mongo import on that CSV file to import the raw data directly in MongoDB, uh, the data would look exactly like this, right? So flat data uh, with just uh, weird, right? Because I have a uh, key value, that's JSON, right? So you have uh, the date as a field, not as a value. And you have the value with, you know, so uh, in that case, it's uh, the confirmed cases, right? And that's not really what I want, right? What I want is one place with the three values, confirmed, death, and recovered, uh, with one date, right? So place, date, and the values for that particular day for that particular place. That's more what I'm looking for. You know, this is kind of uh, useless to me, right? I can't really build a reliable API on top of this. And also, I can't even query the date because it's a field, not uh, a value. So it's kind of weird. So what I want instead is something like this, right? The date 
where you know it's an actual ether date that I can rely on and query in MongoDB, which is way more easy to work with. Like I can use now like greater than, less than operators, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And also, I would like to have, for example, the localization as a GeoJSON point, right? Which is way more convenient to work with as well uh, in MongoDB and easy to query. So uh, there is also one more file, which is one folder up uh, compared to those five, five, five files I just presented. Uh, it's the lookup table they provide. And in this file, they have uh, basically one place. And in one place, they also provide uh, like extra, um, extra information. For example, like the population, latitude, longitude, some ISO codes, et cetera, et cetera, right? And in those uh, files, uh, well, you, you just get more information about the places, right? So you can just uh, increase the data in your data set. So I wanted to combine all that stuff and produce something a bit more convenient for me to use, right? So I used some Python magic, combined all the CSV files, uh, chopped it down, and produced those documents I was dreaming about. And now at the end, they look like this, right? So it's way more easy for me to work with uh, with MongoDB. I have basically here information that comes from that uh, file, uh, from that um, lookup table. I have a bunch of information about the places. I have a date, and I have a bunch of data about uh, the numbers of that particular day uh, in that particular particular place, right? So that's what I have. And that's very convenient for me to work with at that point, right? Because I have everything I need. I can send queries and like build a reliable API on top of this. So at the end, I got uh, like those five collections that you see at the bottom. Uh, so global and US only, they come from those five CSV files. Global and US is the combination, is the union of those two collections. And from those collections, I built the two others, countries summary, which is just uh, basically uh, an aggregation that I use with MongoDB to group all the countries together and get just one value for one country instead of you know having countries divided in, in, step, in states or uh, counties. And then I built the metadata as well that I use uh, for the REST API. Uh, so I produce basically a file uh, with just one single document uh, that contains like all the countries, all the counties, all the states that exist, the minimal date, the maximum date, and all those like uh, metadata values that you can use in the REST API to then send queries on the real REST API. So now. We can start coding, right? I have everything I need. I have all the documents in my database, and I will show you how to build a GraphQL and a REST API uh, directly using those uh, that data set. So let's jump right in. So my cluster, the one that is actually available to you, uh, I, I will share the link as well in the blog post uh, at the end, uh, is right here, right? So I'm in MongoDB Atlas. I will try to zoom in a bit better, like this. And so here you have like the cluster that's running, and I have a pre-prod cluster as well here at the bottom that I use for integration. So we'll use the data that's sitting in this cluster, and I will use here at the top MongoDB Realm, right? So Realm, it's like the backend serverless system that sits you know, on top of MongoDB Atlas, where I can spin up my clusters. And here I can create like a, an application, and in this I can create like a GraphQL API, a REST API. Uh, I can also create uh, like uh, triggers and functions and many, many things like this. So here at the top, I will click, uh, I can make this full tree actually and go with create new app. We'll call this API days. And I will use the pod cluster. So I directly have the right value. And in the advanced configuration here, I will also say that uh, my application is local to Ireland. I have a few regions available, but I will choose Ireland because the cluster is in Ireland, right? So if I'm, my backend system is close to my frontend system, then it's easier for me. I will just click on Create. It takes a few uh, seconds like this to create the cluster. Uh, and now I have access to MongoDB Realm, right? So I can just create my API. So as you can see on the screen, there is many, many things, guides, et cetera, et cetera. And I will just go directly where I need. So for me here, as you can see, I have GraphQL, functions, triggers, and third-party services. So that's where I want to go to create the REST API. 
I will click on Add a Service, and I can integrate, as you can see, with different services like AWS or Twilio, GitHub, etc. But I just want to create HTTP service, so I'll we'll call the REST API REST API because it's very uh, <laughs> original, and uh, I will add a webhook, right, which will be the place where I can send, you know, the actual query. I will call this webhook global, so we'll query the global collection, for example, and I need a get because I want to make this collection read on me. And I will respond with results, of course. And at the bottom here, I could select you know, something to increase the security, but I will just use no additional authorization required. But you could use secrets or payload signature if you like. I will save the draft. And here I have a function. So I will make this a little bit bigger again so everybody can read. All right. So uh, as you can see, I have just a small function with the payload that I get, so that's what I receive, and the response that I have to populate. So uh, I will just get rid of everything that I don't need, so all the comments. Uh, so as you can see, I can retrieve here a payload.query, which retrieves me the argument. So for example, for me, I could retrieve like the country uh, if I want to specify you know, which country I want to get the data from. I could get headers. I can retrieve also like the body if it's a post, for example, but it's a get here. Um, I could do a few things like I can log, of course, all that stuff, but I don't need all that. Uh, I can retrieve a value as well because we can store values like API keys, for example, as secrets and etc. But we don't need that as well. I can get rid of all that stuff actually. I need this though. So this, as you can see, I have context that services.get and I get access to my MongoDB Atlas cluster directly because it's directly binded uh, in the background. I need to access my COVID-19 database. And in this, I can find my global collection and I can do a find one. And if I just do return here, I can get rid of everything else. So just one line actually, if I can type that correctly. If I just hit run, as you can see at the bottom, I'm retrieving already my data, right? So that's not exactly what I want to do. Just testing here that I'm actually connected to MongoDB and that I'm retrieving data. So instead of just returning that at the end of the function, I want to actually answer in the response, right? So to do that, uh, I will just refactor a bit the code. This should be actually a collection, which I call collection like this. Uh, then I just do call dot find one. Here I go to the line. Then and so one once I find a document, uh, I can just call a function, and this function is uh, will return one document because it's a find one, and this document can be set in the response dot set body, and in here. Uh, I need to use uh, the special uh, little function because I need to send a string. So we'll just stringify the JSON document I get and transform this as a string and send this in the response, right? So that's basically all I need, right, at this point. So if I save the draft, let me unzoom a little, go back to the normal view, save draft. I need to review and deploy here at the top to validate my new application that I just created. Uh, it says successful. If I go back to the settings here, I find my webhook URL. Just click here. I have also the curl command directly, but uh, I will just type that myself. So curl, type this. Um, I can just add dash s, so it's silent, and I can pipe that to a pretty uh, uh, to pretty fire. And that's it. As you can see, I retrieve one document, and I'm basically done. So I have done my REST API, right? It's as simple as that. Uh, if I go back in here, I could make things a bit more interesting. So I could, for example, instead of using a find one, I could do a find and transform this into an array. So actually, now I return a list of documents. So if I save this, for example, and redeploy that, uh, it would work as well. And of course, I could make this a bit more interesting by you know, filtering, for example, based on the country. I could use this in the find, use a filter. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I could create this. So I will actually show you that in a second. I can re-execute this. And 
there is a lot of data right now. Yeah, it's it's just too long for the body. I should filter actually. Uh, so if I just put a filter in here, like uh, country, uh, which is just use the country that comes here in the payload. Let's just save this, right, and redeploy right here. I can just add here a small parameter country uh, equal France. Send this. Country is not defined. Huh. And command that. Five demos, right? You know that. You know it works. Up. This one more time. If it doesn't work, that's not a big deal. Yeah, you see that. So now it's uh, small enough. And you can see like all the resources. Uh, cool. And actually, if you do something a bit more uh, like better, you can do it like that. And the code would look like something like this. So you can retrieve actually more build. You can. Uh, create a query, a project, and a sort. Check all those values as you fit. So check that they are, you know, correct, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and well defined. And at the bottom, as you can see, it's the same piece of code here. Collect that find query and project, a sort into array, and that's basically it. So we have one more minute to create a GraphQL API. Let's do that right now. So save the draft. Get out of this view. Let's go to the GraphQL API. So create a GraphQL API, it's super simple. You just generate a JSON schema because GraphQL needs a JSON schema. And you say here you want to add a collection configuration because you need a schema. So you just click on global, which is the one I want. You create a template. You say user can only read all data. You say confirm. What I want to do now is create the schema. So I go to schema, generate schema, and I just generate that schema for that particular collection. It's going to sample the documents automatically for me. And basically, that's it. As you can see, I have a schema. I just click Save. And I can go back to GraphQL now. And as you can see, that's ready to use. I have my GraphQL on point here. It's just right here on the right. And here, I can send queries. I have GraphQL, and I can send my queries. Right? If I add S, for example, in here, globals, and send again, no, it's not find one anymore, it's uh, find many, right? And that's it. I have a working GraphQL API. I can use this to query, and uh, I'm ready to use this uh, to create my uh, my client and et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, that's basically as simple as that. You have uh, at the top, you can you know see the schema. You can retrieve the schema that's been created. You can use custom resolvers if you want to create custom resolvers. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And you have a few settings as well to explore here uh, with validation levels and validation actions, etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So yeah, that's it. That's it for me. Thank you very okay. much. Thank yeah, you for being question. around. One and question: Why is the cloud platform for running your function for this demo? Where is the cloud? Th that's a question. Sorry, can you repeat? Uh, okay. What is the crash? Uh, what is the cloud platform for running your your function in the live demo. So the cloud platform I'm using is MongoDB Atlas, right? So that's mm -hmm. where you can Hello. deploy uh, clusters. And uh, so those clusters, uh, so th that's MongoDB clusters, right? And in MongoDB Atlas, you have like uh, many features like MongoDB Realm, which is what I use to create mm -hmm. uh, the REST and the GraphQL API, which is basically backend serverless, uh, you know, that sits on top of MongoDB Atlas, so on top of your data layer. And you can also use MongoDB charts. So that's what I use, you know, to create uh, those charts. For example, so that dashboard here uh, that I made, you know, uh, at the beginning, I had some screenshots, but they are made also using uh, MongoDB Realm, for example, or MongoDB charts. Sorry, that sits right next to MongoDB Atlas in the same thing. Okay. Yeah. But the, the, the last question: Can you show us what's the benefit or the, uh, the significant benefit if, if we use the low SQL database like Mongo instead of a uh, relational database for your data set demos in live demo? Just like Coven data set. Yeah. So basically, like using MongoDB for me here, it was super easy because, like the as you can see, I changed you know the data format many many times. And also like the CSV files, as you can, you saw you that at the beginning, right? They can change, they they can shift, you know, form. 
there are columns that some sometimes they are here, sometimes they are not here. Uh, like for example, the state and the counties, for example, the field. Sometimes they are here, sometimes they are not here, right? So in MongoDB, I can benefit, you know, from the schema-less or schema-free, you know, uh, uh, thing that you don't have, you know, in a regular, you know, tabular uh, technologies like SQL or or those technologies. So I can really benefit, you know, in this project, you know, from those schema-less and schema-free uh, JSON features. I can also use, like, uh, you know, uh, I use those actually like the arrays. And the sub documents, etc., to make my data kind of 3D, you know, compared to the flat, you know, uh, uh, tabular uh, system that you have in SQL. So, so yeah, actually, it was very, uh, it was very helpful to have this in my project. And uh, as I was iterating, you know, in the different version of my code, uh, it made it made my life really easier to uh, to create those different versions, iterate, try to create charts. Oh, actually, I need something else. I need that extra field. I need the population now. So I could add, you know, the fields as I was coding, and uh, fix my data set, etc., without, uh, you know, restarting from scratch and recreating all the schema design, etc. I just needed to insert the document in the database that I get in MongoDB Atlas, and it was working right away. So yeah. Okay, I think the time is almost up. Thanks, Maxim, for your sharing today. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay. Thank you very much for having me. It, it was great to be my first conference in Hong Kong. So hi everybody, and hopefully you're good. Thank okay. you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you. Have a nice day.